glory. Let's stand up and fellowship this morning in the house of the Lord. Tell someone you're glad to see them on this beautiful Sunday morning.
So many times I've questioned certain circumstances of things I could not understand. And many times in trials, weakness blurs my vision. That's when my frustration gets so out of hand. But then I am reminded I've never been forsaken. I've never had to stand one test alone. As I look at all the victories, the Spirit rises up in me. It's through the fire my weakness is made strong. He never promised the cross would not get heavy and the hill would not be hard to climb. He never offered victories without Just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision and the adversary says, give in, just hold on, all on the shore, and he will take you through the fire again. I know within my Myself that I would surely finish. Oh, but if I trust the mighty hand of God, the shield the flames again. Again. He never promised the cross would not get heavy. Just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision And the adversary says, give in, just hold on All of the show up And he will take you through the fire again just And he will take you through the fire again, again. <laughs> Technology can't live with it, can't live without it. Something like that. Is it technology or women? I get them confused. <laughs> I can say that my wife's out in the chapel, all right? All right, so turn in your Bibles if you have them to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. What an awesome uh, privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord looking around, seeing new faces, seeing little babies, seeing nanas and papas spoiling little babies. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to be in His house. This morning we're going to talk about breaking down walls. Um, pretty good chance we all know what it is to have uh, someone knock us or judge us wrongfully because of our race, color of our hair, freckles on our skin, perhaps uh, our economic situation. Culture, religion, on and on and on. 
Let me say to you as a fellow that knows what it is to be made fun of because of your hair color. I remember growing up and seeing Christians stand up here. Isn't it amazing how time flies? I leaned over to Roy. I, I'm, I'm pastor, so I have this privilege. I get to name groups. Those two girls, that's the us uh sisters. Anna and Emma. 25 years ago, Anna's mom and Emma's mom were standing here singing. How amazing. How amazing. And that redheaded fella that sang for you, my nephew Christian, I'm sure Christian knows what it is to be made fun of because you have red hair. We have a lot of red, we are blessed with some redheads up in this place. I'm just going to tell you. I don't know what it is, but we are blessed with redheads. I remember what it was like to be made fun of for having red hair and for having freckles. And at the time, I didn't like it. But let me say to y'all, 40 years later, I wish that red hair they made fun of would return. <laughs> I remember, uh, I think it was around third grade. I was the last of six, around third grade. I know it is to be made fun of because of where, what you wear around third grade. My mother, bless her heart, Sent me to school, third grade, in a pair of bell bottoms, 1983. <laughs> Some of y'all are going, what are bell bottoms? <laughs> Can you picture a red-headed little freckle-faced boy trying to play some kickball? Every time I'd kick the ball, my leg would parachute up into the air. <laughs> I came home and I cried to my mama, and I want to say, I love you, mama, because she never made me wear those bell bottom pants back to school. Now, I'm, I'm giving you a couple examples of my childhood, but perhaps you were made fun of because of the way you looked or the way you walked or because of the clothes that you wore. Maybe you were made fun of because of your race or your background or something along those lines. We know what it is to be judged or to be put down because of things that are out of our hands. This morning, I want to talk to the Christians in the house, and we're going to talk about breaking down walls of race and culture. And we're going to look to the example that's given to us in the first church, in the book of Acts, chapter 8. I want us to begin reading in verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence in the sanctuary today. Thank you for every household that is represented with us this morning. Thank you for the time that we have together in your word. So, Father, today as we look into this passage, as we share the message that you've laid upon our hearts, perhaps we're here today and we're the offended. We're those that know what it is to be looked down upon because of things, because of stuff, because of hair color or lack of hair, or etc., etc. And perhaps we're here today as the offender. We're the ones that have put people down. Father, I pray if we're somewhere there or in the middle, that this message would resonate within our soul and we would realize as your people, you've called us to be holy. You've called us to be a peculiar people, to stand out for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for the church this morning. Use us, speak to our hearts. And Father, if there be one here today that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, perhaps today, is the day of their salvation. God, we ask today that you would move upon hearts and lives. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. These words we ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ. God's people said, Amen. Amen. So as we read these first four verses, I want to say that to the church we are called to break down the walls of race and culture. The example given before us in this passage is Philip. He's going and he's preaching to the Samaritans. And I would say to you, if you'll do a little bit of background uh, research, you'll see that him going to the Samaritans in itself 
is huge. Now, maybe you, you don't know and you would say, well, why is it so huge? Somebody going and preaching. Isn't that what we see throughout Scripture? It is. But you need to know a little bit of background about the Jews and the Samaritans. They hated one another. They hated, they hated one another. Worse than Alabama and Georgia Bulldog fans, y'all. They hated one another. They despised one another. The Samaritans, to the Jews, they called them, at best, they called them half-breeds. They called them traitors to the Jewish nation. They, they called them this primarily because they had chosen to intermarry, or, or to intermarry with other cultures and they sold themselves. The Jews would look at the Samaritans and say they had sold themselves with uh, foreigners during the time of the exile. Now, on the other side of the, of the street was the Samaritans and they couldn't stand the Jews because the Jews were always looking down upon them. There was major animosity between these two peoples. If you will, sometime in your study this week, go to John chapter 4 and read or perhaps reread the story of Jesus at the well with a woman from Samaria. The Samaritan woman comes up, and if you know the story, she won't even look at Jesus. And when he asks of her, she questions that, why are you being a Jew asking me, a Samaritan, to give you water? And even in the story, as Jesus touches her heart, changes her life, the disciples come back and they scoff. What is he doing talking to this Samaritan woman? We know the love of Jesus Christ. It compelled him. There was no wall of race and culture with that woman at the well. And in 2019, God wants you and I as his people to look past race and culture and love people because we have this realization that they need Jesus Amen. as Lord and Savior. Remember the song we grew up, grew up singing as kids? One of the first songs I learned to sing. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. A simple kid's song, but isn't it true? Can you say amen? amen? And with that same love, God has called us to love our Hispanic brothers, our black brother, my Indian brother, the mulatto brother, regardless of race, we must see people that they have a soul and that they need Jesus Christ. We are called to break down the walls of race and culture. And like Philip, if, if we will, we must allow the love of Jesus Christ to break down those walls. Secondly, this morning, the second point I would proclaim to you from this passage we're called to break down the walls, but we're also called to build up the kingdom and not compromise the gospel. We're called to build up the kingdom and not compromise the gospel. There's a lot of this going on in 2019. Look back with me to verse 9 of Acts chapter 8. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God, and to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip's preaching, the, or Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen, he was fallen upon none of them." Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands, their hands upon them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. 
But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Let me say to you this morning as we read this passage, Peter and John were not willing to compromise the gospel for money. Let me say to you this morning, it's, it's not always easy in the world that we live in to stand upon the truth. It's not always advantageous to stand upon the truth. But as we see this example of Peter and John, they wouldn't compromise the truth even though it would offend Simon. Let me say to you, this is coming from the pastor. The gospel of Jesus Christ is pretty offensive. It didn't offend you when you realized you were going to hell. Pretty offensive to me. But it's beautiful because on the other side is the realization. I'm lost without hope. But because Jesus, the Son of God, came, died, and rose again, I can have victory over death, hell, and the grave just like he did. So you see, when we're out in the world and, and Satan wants us to smooth it over or water it down or take away or add to it like many do, that's not God telling you to do that. We're called to break down walls, but at the same time, we're called to build up the kingdom of Jesus Christ and not compromise the gospel. It's not about buildings. It's not about music styles. It should be about Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're called to break down the walls, but we're also called to build up the kingdom and not compromise the gospel. We cannot compromise the gospel. We cannot compromise our faith for wealth or fame. Nor can we compromise the faith because it will offend those that do not believe. Thirdly, this morning, as we look to this passage, we're called to break down the walls of race and culture. We're called to build up the kingdom and not compromise the gospel. And thirdly, we're called to love those who aren't even on our team. Even Alabama fans. I give Alabama fans a hard time from this pulpit because do y'all see what they do to me every week on Facebook? So I'm giving it right back to them. But I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Even the ones that say roll tide. Even the ones that say go Gators. That's never came out of my mouth. We're called to love the others, even those who are not on our team. Not on our team. You see, so often, and I'm, I'm preaching to the pastor this morning, so often the adversary wants me to think the adversary in my life is people. It's not. A child, I'm, a, I'm a child of the king. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, it's all because of what he's done, nothing that I've done. I am his. Therefore, the adversary who is beneath our feet in the name of Jesus wants us to take the crosshairs off of him and place it on those around us. Now, I've always said, and I've often said from this pulpit, I'm amazed with people that work in customer service. Why? Why, Pastor Jeff? Because they deal with people. Do you, do you, how many times have you seen somebody come up to a customer service desk and say, I'm just here today to tell y'all I love this store. Y'all are doing such a phenomenal job. Here's a gift card. Mm -mm. <laughs> no, it's usually the vice versa. And you ever had that person in front of you? You know it's not going to be good. And you're thinking for that poor girl behind the desk because you just see it on there. Their ears are getting red at the top. They're just sitting there brewing. They can't wait to issue their complaint. There's some difficult people in the world to love. Can I get a witness in the house? Don't poke somebody beside you. There's some, there's some difficult people to love, but let me tell you who God's called us to love. Everyone. The person that hates me? Yeah. What about so-and-so? They run me down. Yeah. What about so-and-so? They gossip about me and my family constantly. Yes. 
You know who needs your prayers and your love more? Them. Them. You see, we find in this passage of Scripture this third truth. We're called to love those who aren't even on our team. And here my thinking is, those who are not saved, those who are not born again, washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Look back to Acts 8. Look at verse 26. I love this part of the story. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down unto Jerusalem, unto Gaza, unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Who had the charge over all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for worship was returning and, and sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. I love when God throws a curve. Let me tell you this story. You, you can read it, read the rest of the passage for you. Philip happens into the desert. He don't just happen. He goes and he's obeying the Lord and he goes into the desert and he's there and he looks and he sees this eunuch. And this eunuch is in a chariot and, and for us to even understand this. All right, so here's my redneck logic. Picture Philip riding down the street on a lawnmower, okay? And it's a beat-up lawnmower. It doesn't even have a hood on it. It's just barely going. And he looks and coming the same way as a guy in a Mercedes Benz, and he is going down the highway, and God says, go to him. See, that, you get all that from the story? He's on foot, and the eunuch is in a chariot, and God says, go to him. And he goes to the eunuch, and the eunuch, he asks the eunuch, what are you reading? And the eunuch tells him, I'm reading Isaiah, and he expounds, and it's the passage of Scripture. As a lamb, he's led to the, uh, to the slaughter. And as, as a lamb, he did not open his mouth. And, and, and Philip looks at this eunuch, and he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch says, how can I understand except someone tell me or explain it to me? And Philip says, can I? You see, this is a powerful story because in this moment, Philip could have gone the Baptist route and he could have said, Lord, you don't have time for me. He's in a chariot. I'm, I'm on foot. He doesn't have time for me. God, he's, he's above me. I'm, I'm, I'm lowly. He's a eunuch. He's of a royal court. He won't hear a word that I have to say. He, Philip might not have been a Baptist. He could have said, Lord, I don't feel like running today. But he didn't use any of those excuses. He ran up beside the chariot. He explains the scripture. And Philip looks to the eunuch and he says, do you believe? And he says, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And they're continuing on in their chariot. And the eunuch sees water and says to Philip, hey, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And the eunuch and Philip get out of the chariot and they walk down to the water and the eunuch is baptized. And to our knowledge, that's the end of, of the conversation. We don't ever read of Philip conversing with this eunuch ever again. Can I tell you what, what to me is awesome? I believe God uses Philip's act of obedience to begin revival in Ethiopia. How do you know, Jeff? The Bible doesn't say that. God plants the seed of the gospel in the hearts of the lost so that they can take the gospel to the others who are lost. Amen. You see, that's what I'm talking about. We are to love those who are not even on our team. Colin and Andy, if you'll join me, please. I wanted to read you this story. I love, I love baseball. I love the Braves, but there hadn't been a whole lot good to talk about lately with the Braves. I'll tell you right up there with watching Major League Baseball to me is college softball. Those girls are bad mamma jammas, let me tell you. Woo! You can say what you want. Somebody said, 
Well, you know, the pitch mound is so much closer to home plate. Yeah. You've never stood and let one of those girls come off the hip with one of them 60 mile per hour fastballs. I found this story and I want to share it to you. And we're thinking about loving those who are not on our team. The church, the redeemed, the saved, the born again, loving those who are not part of the church. I want to tell you a story. That This one don't have a battery. I want to tell you a story of a young lady by the name of Sarah Tukulski. She played softball at Western Oregon. She was a wolf at Western Oregon University. Western Oregon gets to the end of the season and they're playing a series against Central Washington. It's the best two out of three and the winner goes on to the Division II playoffs. Now, Sarah Tukulski, I'm telling you this story of this girl, but I want to tell you, she's not the superstar on the team. She's a senior. Her batting average is a whopping 153. She gets up to the, it's, it, it's the end of the second game, and if her team wins, they go on to the championship. They go on to the playoffs. By the way, she's never hit a home run in her life. She gets up to bat, whopping 153 batting average, and it happens. Her senior year in a crucial game that would send her team to the playoffs. Tukulski hits her first homer with two teammates already on base in front of her. The exuberant former high school point guard sprints around first as she reaches the bag. She looks up to watch the ball clear the fence and misses first base. Six feet past the bag, she stops abruptly to return and touch it, but something gave way in her right knee. She collapses to the ground in the base path. I was in a lot of pain, she told the Oregonian newspaper. Our first base coach was telling me I had to crawl back to first base. I can't touch you, she said. If I touch you, you'll be out. I can't help you. Tukulski, to the horror of her teammates and spectators, crawled through the dirt and pain to first. Western Oregon coach Pam Knox rushes onto the field and talks to the umpires near the pitching mound. The umpires said Knox could place a substitute runner at first. Tukulski would be credited with a single and two RBIs, but the home run would be erased. The umpires said a player cannot be assisted by their team around the bases, Knox said. But it is her only home run in four years. She's going to kill me if we sub and take it away. But at the same time, I was concerned for her. I didn't know what to do. That is when Mallory Holtman stepped in. Mallory Holtman is the greatest softball player in central Washington history, their adversary that day. Normally, when the conference's all-time home run leader steps in, Coach Pam Knox and other conference coaches grimace. But on senior day, the first baseman volunteered a simple, selfless solution to her opponent's dilemma. What if, what if the Central Washington players carried Tukulski around the bases? The umpires said there was nothing in the rule book to preclude, uh, to preclude help from the opposition. Holtman asked her teammate, junior st uh, shortstop and honors program student Liz Wallace, to lend a hand. The teammates walked over and picked up Tukulski and resumed the home run trot, pausing at each base to allow Tukulski's foot to touch the bag. Central Washington, hear this now, Central Washington lost the game by a final score of four to two. Sarah Tukulski's three-run homer was the difference. But to Mallory Holtman and Liz Wallace, crossing the finish line to help someone on the other team meant more to them than winning itself. I want you to see a beautiful picture.
Stand with me this morning. What a beautiful, selfless picture. Helping others win the victory.